Hi, and welcome back to Adventuring Academy. I'm your host, Brandon Lee Mulligan. With me today is the, an incredible friend, one of my oldest and dearest friends. Uh, she's a writer on Owl House for Disney. She's the author of the Witch Boys series. She's the artist behind the seminal, groundbreaking <laughs> webcomic and graphic novel series, Strong Female Protagonist. Heard of it? Please welcome my friend, Molly Ostertag. Yay! Hi. <laughs> hey, Molly. Thanks so much for coming by. Oh, my God. I'm so happy to be here. I'm very <laughs> excited. Uh, and honored to be on your D&D podcast. And we are honored to have you. By yeah. the way, I mean me and Alphonse here. Um, hmm. He's looking uh, his usual perky self. Why do you have to gender the skeleton? <laughs> like it could be uh, no. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Alphaba or Alphonse, okay. uh, we are so excited to have you. And uh, Molly, you hold the distinction of being the only dungeon master that has actually allowed me to play <laughs> through and finish a campaign of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh my God, I'm, you did it. I'm truly like so honored to have that. <laughs> and it's, I can understand why it's a rare thing. Cause it's very, it was very hard to wrap it up. It was hard to like, just keep all you guys on track. Like people were moving across the country. People were getting jobs. People were yeah, yeah getting caught up and stuff. And it's just like, I really, really wanted to like make a campaign that I could see through. Yeah. Um, well, real life is a nightmare, and yes. it's, logistically, it's very unfair to all these wonderful fictional characters that are trying just to mm -hmm. save the world and themselves. <sighs> yeah, they're that, just trying to like <laughs> hang out and like finish their stories and like get a conclusion to their narrative. Yeah, and then you got to pick up and move to you know Washington or whatever. God, Keely. <laughs> Keely. <laughs> one friend who did that, love her very much. <laughs> like, yeah, I get it. It's like your real actual life, but yeah. like, you could. You could, you know, you could help <laughs> us out. Um, uh, but that's so interesting. Uh, do you think, other than the logistics of real life, which are very real, uh, most DMs that watch this uh, are struggling even to like start a campaign. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's so far down the line to think of the challenge of ending one. But it's actually a very real challenge. It's yeah. one of the hardest things to do. Uh, in Dimension 20, we've now shot a couple seasons of it. And it's the wildest thing about it is how, look, I have a lot of training and experience in running the beginning and middles of campaigns. The fact that I've ended three campaigns in the last year is crazy. Oh, that's so cool though. I mean, it's a good, I think it's like, it. you don't have to go into a campaign with the desire to have it have an end. Like mm -hmm. it's also very admirable to just be like, I just want to keep this fun thing going as long as it possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, but like for me as like, especially like I love, my favorite form of stories ever are books. And I just love, I love a story that has a beginning, a middle and an end. And I love how an end puts the rest of it in context and gives you all these feelings. So I, with our campaign that we played specifically, um, I like very much wrote that with the end in mind. Well, Cause I just knew that it would give it meaning if we could see that we were heading towards this thing. And then if we sort of have this like emotional last session, like it, 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 it gives it it gives it this structure and meaning that um, sometimes I missed in D and D. Well, you're a ma I mean I don't say this lightly. You're like a master of story structure. You love <laughs> stories and how they're put together and how what they mean. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about today, as someone who works on an animated show but also has done comics, and we've talked about this a lot because both you and I come from a LARP background, yes. Wayfinder experience. Yes, we met when uh, thirteen years ago. <laughs> I was thinking of it this morning. <laughs> 13 years, yeah. my God. Uh, yeah, a long time mm -hmm. ago. Uh, so we've <laughs> all worked, you and I, in multiple different mediums of storytelling. And to talk about screenwriting for, an, uh, for a, a moment, Robert McKee has a great thing he said that really illuminated screenwriting for me, which was, and I think you would dig this and probably agree with it, which is stories are not about their premises. Stories are about their conclusions. Mm -hmm. That like the point, in other words, like premises are great. And a lot of writers start with like, here's like a fun beginning or like a world design that I'm thinking of. But really that the th the meaning we take from stories is about how they wrap up, yeah. how they end, yeah. what we take away from them, which really spelled things out for me. But in the context yeah. of D&D, &D, that feels really challenging. Yeah. Yeah, there's a good um, like Kurt Vonnegut quote I think too about or he's like where he's like you should start a story as close to the end as possible, <laughs> which I really love of just like it does like it 
it should be the time when everything matters the most, kind of like the time when the stakes are the most heightened. Like, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You really get into it. Uh, well, that's that's a weird thing. Tra talking about like the cross pollination of different sort of mediums. Mm -hmm. That's a note that we give in improv all the time. Mm. Is for your scene to be as clear as possible, for clarity's sake, start in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, don't start at the beginning. Totally, uh, yeah. Which I think is really amazing, because because and people will sometimes get confused by that. And this is a cool thing to relate it back to D and D and to our people watching at home. When you think about starting your campaign, think about starting your campaign in media res, right? Like think yeah. about starting it like as the structures of the world are already kind of moving or beginning, because human beings are designed to pick up on context clues coming into the middle of something. If you are listening, if you're like eavesdropping on a stranger's phone call and they have like a 20 minute phone call and you only get to listen to 30 seconds of it, where do you put your 30 seconds in that 20 minute phone call mm -hmm. to have the best shot at getting what the conversation was mm, about? That's such a good way to think of it, yeah. And it's like, oh, the middle. Yeah. Because if you, if you do the beginning, I'm just gonna catch like the sort of greeting. If I do yeah. the end, I might miss a lot of context, but you go right to the middle and you catch some juicy bit of gossip right there, you'll probably be able to put a lot of people pieces together just from content, you know, Yeah. cutting into the middle of like, look, I'm sorry, I'll get the carpet replaced. I'm going through a tough time at work. <laughs> you go like, oh, that's right in the middle of things. But I mm -hmm. actually can kind of figure out what happened yeah. just from this thing that we're starting with. Totally. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fun in D&D &D to be like, I mean, I really encourage you guys when you're developing your characters to have backstories already to be kind of like, like, um, yeah, like your character was, you sort of already had this thing where it was like the ocean swept you away from your home and you spent a year as a, like traveling with a carnival and like, like Noelle's character like had had a previous life like doing something else and then kind of like being an actor and then she was like doing a second career like, and it was, it's just very cool to be like your characters are existing in a context and they're ex existing in a world where things are already happening. Yeah, and where things change and you kind of need that structure of beginning, middle, and end. So I would say for Dungeon Master, one thing I will say that I loved about Pilgrimage, which was Molly's campaign that we all got to play in and mm -hmm. finish, was the degree of finiteness and this kind of like, I almost want to say it was almost like a deathly or a, a, a finality quality or was, there's some kind of a grave thing to it, which is, was you're possessed by this demon. We knew it like session two going in. And yeah. well, the first session was the first session. I was just looking at my notes to like, because I haven't played D&D &D for like six months. So I wanted to remember like mm -hmm. what the last campaign I did was. But yeah, it was like the first session you guys it ended with you guys all getting possessed with a demon and it was like slowly going to consume you and then yeah. break out and consume the entire world unless you traveled and did this huge pilgrimage to each of the like six uh, major god temples. And so it was just like, it was very clear and that is like, that's what you did. And it ended when you went to the last temple and it was like, it was sort of like this like, like suicidal road trip. Like <laughs> that was very, it just gave everything this real, I think like, yeah, it just like, it gave everything this like, mm -hmm. I don't know, the characters were sort of, they had to stick together mm -hmm. and they had to like think about their lives and think about like, oh my God, this is the end of my life. Like this horrible thing is happening to me and I have to like, how do I cope with it? Oh, um, And I, that would like, ended up having all these really cool character moments. Well, I remember when I started <laughs> to get the vibe of like, oh, this is going, because we started on the temple on the God of protection, went to the goddess of love and, continuing that loop to the temples, I realized about like one or two gods <laughs> later, I was like, oh, we're gonna end on the god of death. <laughs> we're not all gonna make it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like not, just like, ooh, that's a bad one to end on. We're gonna, re <laughs> this is gonna be rough. Um, and it was so beautiful. But what I actually love about that is so much of my experience and time playing D&D &D was kind of set around like, and just the way the IDM is very sandboxy mm -hmm. and very, much like, oh, kind of like relying on the PCs to put their kind of plot up, which I think also has strengths to it. But I was amazed at, in Pilgrimage, how much freedom I felt like I was given by knowing what we were up to. Mm, the fact yeah. that the structure kind of existed from the beginning allowed me to take risks with my character that I otherwise wouldn't have. Where I was like, no, like we have, our quest is to go to these six temples. We might fail, we could get killed, like the, this sort of evil demonic cult could win, but we're moving along from place to place and as we move along, we are 
changing and having that structure be in place let me like take creative risks with the character and make choices for them uh that were so rewarding and fun by virtue of having that structure that's really cool that's really good to hear because i definitely was i had a worry that i would be imposing this thing and it was like this you know the demonic curse like it gave you guys powers it changed the way you looked and i was worried that i was kind of like imposing too much on Mm -hmm. the players but i really did i think that everybody sort of like took it and ran with it and made it their own story um, I was sort of like trying to explain, I was talking to somebody the other day about D&D who plays it in a much more um, comedic way. And I was talking about like how I love to DM because I like, I'm not like super good at writing comedy. Mm-hmm. I'm getting better. I'm learning how to do it at my job right now. But mm-hmm. like, um, I, I really like to just do, do like this like very serious story and to be like, here's like the hard world that the characters can bounce off of. Like the characters are the funny ones. They're the ones that are rubber. Yeah. And they, but then like there's certain parts of the world and certain parts of the story that are like super solid. Yeah. because it can give you something to bounce off of and to react to and to exist within. I think that's so smart. I feel like that's, and it's very telling too. And I think that like, well, I think what's wild is, is I forget who, it might've been Mike Morales or somebody who was talking about this, who was making a point saying, sandbox versus railroad style playing, neither of these are good or bad. Mm -hmm. They are both completely valid. And one of the things I actually liked about your campaign, um, and this is something to consider if you're a DM watching this at home, who's thinking about creating a more railroad campaign, meaning like the plot is there from the beginning. This is gonna sound funny, what I liked about your sort of on the rails campaign was there was a reason within the world for it to be on rails. Yeah. It was like, yeah. no, no, check it out. You got cursed by a demon. Here's the way to stop it. You're welcome to do what you want, but the world will end. Yeah. Well, and I actually like the the way that I like first started thinking about the game was that I was like, I feel like people always like make these really extreme characters. It's sometimes really hard to justify them all being together in a group Mm -hmm. and to be like, okay, you all have to go to this thing. And it's hard to find like a goal for that everybody will equally want to do. And like, if they're having personality conflicts, to like be like, why won't you just run off and go do your own thing? Besides the fact that you're all playing together and you wanna stay in the game. And so I just was like, what's like something that could bring everyone together? And like, what if you all have to stick together and do this quest, cause you're all cursed. And like that, it's fun. Yeah, I think it allowed for there to be these like inner party conflicts Mm -hmm. um, because people were like, we're fucking stuck with each other. Like, (laughs) like, Like, I am so mad about this. And like, I can like rebel against it and everybody else in this world gets to do what they want, but we have to do this one thing. Yeah. Um, Because that is like, you are like, the party is separate from everybody in the world by virtue of being the PCs, um, but to like sort of give it a reason um, felt kind of felt kind of neat. Yeah, it felt really neat too because I th- I think what people resent about railroad campaigns is when the the restrictions put on PCs abilities are born of out of game factors. So mm-hmm. you're like, our characters are totally free to do mm-hmm. what we want. Let's not go to this dungeon. It makes more sense for us to ride north and try to get allies here. And then your DM goes, um, <laughs> uh, there's an earthquake there's and a-, a cavern opens and you can't, you can't, you just can't cross it. You like- just can't cross it. And you begin to resent <laughs> that because you're like, well, what the fuck? Like, yeah. Uh, but I think that actually a railroad is really gratifying when it's supremely well justified in the game because that tracks to real life as well. Like sometimes you're in periods of your life where it's very sandboxy. And I think this is, you know, forget fantasy for a mm-hmm. second. There are chapters of everyone's life where you're like, whoa, I'm really at a crossroads. I can kind of do multiple different things here. What do I want to do? And there's other chapters of your life where some outside event forces your hand and you are kind of forced to be reactive. And you're like, here's the situation as it exists. My choices are limited. Here's what I can do. Yeah. And your choice is like, yeah, how do you how do you react in that situation? And there's so much interest in that. And so much interest with a character of like, yeah, if they're compelled to do something, do mm-hmm. they rebel? Do they try to run away? Do they get angry? Do they come up with coping strategies? It um, was so yeah. it was so beautiful. And that's the thing too, is if you're if you're really role playing 
like as hard as you can. If you, like if you as a DM are encouraging your players to explore those inner things, the fact that our characters were always were from the beginning bound to this curse and stuck with each other created so much of a focus for me at least on playing the internal life of mm -hmm. my character because it was this and I've talked about this before on this podcast, but I've basically like played this character that was this very peaceful, loving monk spiritual character. Mm -hmm. An island boy. An island boy. Yes. He was like a temple dancer, very sweet, good natured monk cleric. And as this curse befell them and they started meeting gods, he just started to question the nature of reality. And then also it was this thing of, and this might be because every character is fundamentally played by a player who can't <laughs> escape themselves. But it was true that when we first, when the, I was playing a sweet, chill character who first encountered real evil injustice and suddenly was like, I can't be the way I've been. Yeah. Like, I can't be relaxed about <laughs> this, and I can't allow this to continue. Yeah. Um, I would love to see you play a truly neutral character. A sometimes. truly neutral. Well, I can't imagine it. <laughs> what's weird is I've played evil characters before, and that's yeah. been fine. But I'm sure that you've, like... <laughs> I think I have an easier time playing evil characters than neutral characters. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so funny, too, because, like, so this is what I love about D&D. &D. So, like, I... Because, like, I'm a storyteller in a lot of ways. I make, like, my, like biggest love is like graphic novels, um, which I like write and draw myself. It's very much just me. And I love the collaborative nature of D&D because I am bringing in my like brilliant friends who are all like writers of some sort and getting to just play in these different styles and to be like, I feel like my worlds are definitely like, I, I, I don't know, things are like a little looser sometimes. And like, especially with morality, I'm kind of just trying to like mimic realistic things, but not always think out like what's good and what's bad. And then like whenever you play, you're always like that, that's bad. And it's always like, I remember like we we went to like the dwarf homelands and I just had like a throwaway line where I was like, they have like elementals powering mining machines. And you were like, that's slavery. And I was like, okay, you're right, you're right. I didn't, I just thought, I just thought I didn't really, truly did not think beyond the image of like a cool fire giant, like powering a steam powered mining equipment, but like, you always are like, I am thinking things through to like the the like most intense, like moral, logical conclusion. These are how systems of oppression yeah. propagate. All right. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Because it's it's just but it, it's it's so funny to be like, yeah, I feel like all of my PCs are always kind of like they're like, I don't know. I mean, just do this because I'm asking you to and I want you to do it. And like, I'm sort of selfish. And then you're like, you're evil. And I'm like, are they? They're selfish. I don't know. It's 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 fun. Well, it's really fun. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's a, uh, I well, I'm glad that my that, that I'm like that PC, but instead of being like, I'm in a metagame and, and get overpowered, I'm like, I'm challenging the morality. Oh, no, world. yeah, I love, well, I love it, because it's just, it's like, it's like, I only have so much that like my writing brain, I don't know, like I have my interests and I explore them and then to have people with different interests playing in the world, it forces me to like explore that more. That's such a good point. Yeah. That, that your PCs really do dictate the world because your PCs are going to explore what they want to explore and that won't map to your interests as a DM. So again, for like yeah. DMs that are watching this, a lot, when people emphasize improv and like that DMs have to have a certain degree of improvisational ability, what we're talking about is not that preparation is wrong or bad. It's obviously good. Prepare as much mm -hmm. as you want to. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to predict the lines of focus and attention and interest yeah. of your player characters. What they're going to interrogate will surprise you. <laughs> For me, it's always going to be cosmology and ethics. Like I remember, <laughs> I remember it fucking like it's so funny because I don't think you will think of this as like the, a moment where you as a DM gave me the most fun thing mm -hmm. when I. I, when we got to the temple of the god of war, which was like this giant Colosseum blood sport mm -hmm. place, and this huge fiery like god of, of like warfare and bloodshed and destruction, and I cast detect evil and good on him, and I was like, is he demonic or is he celestial? And you were like, celestial. He's a god. He's a god. And I was like, okay, so that means that gods do not always represent what is good because I understand <laughs> that this God is not good. Yeah. But, but 
as a cleric, I have to acknowledge that this God is necessary, which means my relationship to the idea of divinity has to become about God's representing not what is right, but what is true. Which is funny, too, because I feel like I was like, I was definitely approaching this world from a very like Greek myth kind of divinity where it's like, yeah, they're giant people who like represent things and <laughs> will be as selfish and horrible as humans. And you sort of had this like more modern like Christian thing, maybe where it's like divinity is good. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you like your character definitely came into it being like, what is the nature of divinity? And I was like, well, they're large and um, <laughs> they big. Glow. Divinity is big. Size. Lots of magic. <laughs> <laughs> Themes. They each have a theme. <laughs> they live in a big house. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny to do the reverse of our world's timeline where he was coming from a kind of monotheistic place yeah. and it was like, no, no, polytheism is where we're moving towards uh -huh. and yeah. it's not about, it's a very pagan ideal. Yeah, um, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was so fun. Um, yeah. Well, I love that. Well, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit today uh, about something that we've come up with a lot that's come up on the podcast as mm -hmm. well. We had uh, Erica Ishii on the podcast. We were talking a lot about inclusivity in Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've talked in the podcast before about how welcoming D and D, specifically like Fifth Edition, has been to the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah. What is it about? plunging into dungeons with your friends <laughs> to collect treasures and defeat. It's, it's just inherently queer. It's like, inherently queer. Yeah. Where do these queer narratives arise from? It's so funny. It's such a huge, it's been such a bloom in like the last five years, I think. I was at um, FlameCon last summer, which is a LGBTQ comic convention in New York City, um, which is it's just like the, you know, the middle of the Venn diagram of like nerd stuff and LGBTQ stuff. And it was like, it's a very big middle of that Venn diagram. And I was on uh, their like Dungeons and Dragons panel and it was like the most packed panel I've ever been on. Like it was so, like people were just crowding in and like standing around the walls. Like it was just so... I don't know, there is this really intense interest in it that I think comes from a lot of different places. Definitely the language in fifth edition is really inclusive mm -hmm. in a way that it's just cool to be like, it's cool when, I, when fantasy is very much like, yes, you are a part of this world. Not like, sure, you can imagine yourself in it, but it's like, no, you are. Like here, like here are rules and here's writing specifying that like queer people are in this world. That's really special. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, I think it's really compelling to like try on identities and try on characters. I think everybody likes that, but I think it has like a special interest for people in the queer community to kind of get to be like, like to experiment, to be like, what is, what do I find compelling? What feels right for me? What is fun to play? What is sort of like a model that maybe I could be like in the future? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's huge. Well, we also both, uh, our LARP background, yeah. uh, specifically is also much like uh, D&D Fifth Edition, but but in this case, an actual like camp, an yeah. actual community. Yeah, physical is summer camp. Incredibly inclusive and extremely beneficial for a yeah. lot of kids that come out there that are LGBTQ that are, you know, it, it's, it's both like, wonderful and amazing to be like, whoa, like when I was, you know, 14, mm -hmm. this hobby was not as inclusive as it is now, but suddenly has it has become more inclusive. You go like, oh, of course, obviously, like for the same reason that so many of our LGBTQ kids at camp value this experience, because literally yeah. we are saying like, take this safe space to understand other identities and mm. therefore understand your own yeah. more. And the idea, I think it's the idea that identity can be a constructed thing. The idea that you can be someone other than yourself or that you can present yourself in a certain way is just like, it, it brings up a lot of like, ideas. Mm -hmm. I think it's like like experiment the word experimentation can like get a bad rap in the queer community because it's used to like dismiss people mm -hmm. of like oh you're experimenting. But it's like in an ideal world you can experiment. You can like try identities on and figure out what is compelling for you. And so something like D&D &D or LARPing is like yeah, it's such a I like I have this I have this story and I know a lot of people who've had a similar story where they played like a gay or like bi or like however they identify they played that character before they came out. Yeah. Like and it's just like I definitely had that experience and it's like it was so meaningful. It was so good to be able to be like in this one very safe place in a basement with a couple of my friends I will play as like a gay character yeah. and kind of just like just like it's so low key but it feels really safe. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Is it's so safe. It's so low-key. It's a game. You got, like, chips and soda and snacks ready yeah. to sing at a table. But it's huge. Yeah. And I think that it's something that is so easy to see mm -hmm. the positive and the benefit of it in terms of gender and identity and sexuality. Uh, and the truth is that that's what the game has always been, though just not as explicitly for LGBTQ mm -hmm. issues. Why do we play? Why do you pretend to be a hero? Because you're tr like, you know, everything I, under this is very corny to say, but like, whoever you are playing these characters in these games, you are getting practice on doing the brave thing yeah. and the selfless thing. Yeah. Um, and it stands to reason that if you can get practice being a hero, you can get practice being a queer hero. Mm -hmm. You can get practice being a hero that maps to an identity that you share. You know, in yeah. this first season of Fantasy High, we had a character that had a mental illness. We had a character that was adopted. You know, you're exploring issues of identity. And when you can do that through a character, you're given this safety because it's not really you. So you mm -hmm. can take bigger risks. They don't feel as scary. Yeah. But then you're also learning. Um, you know, it's a crazy thing. I remember, I think I might have told this story in the podcast before, but I remember being, you know, like an 11 or a 12 year old boy and 11 and 12 year old boys are terrors on the earth. Uh, <laughs> just, you know, uh, a monster, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, just wow, ah, little hyper, mm -hmm. you know, just stained terrifying. with terrifying, terrifying, yeah, right? Truly. Um, but I was playing, uh, and this is a really interesting thing too, talking about identity. Uh, my favorite PC when I was younger was uh, Evia Darkshot. She she was a tiefling fighter in a Planescape Whoa. setting. She had like bright red eyes and horns and long blue hair and <laughs> reddish skin and claws and stuff. And it was me playing a, a woman, which as a 12 year old boy, it just was like. That's really interesting. Was she your, like your first character? She was like my main. She was like That's my main so interesting. PC. Did you like have a thought as a young boy like just like that you wanted to play a female character or like was it a thought process for you or? Yeah, I mean it was this weird thing where I was like, and listen, there were certainly some like 12 year old boy things about it because I was like, let me tell you, this character, she's hot. <laughs> she is really hot. And there was a part of me I mean, she's was, a tiefling. She's like, a tiefling. We all, like, we all get we it. We all know. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> we're all there. We're all there. But there was part of it too where I was just like, um, I think there was, because the earlier characters I had made, had, I made like a little gnome character who was a man. I made an Alagai paladin, like a Yeti paladin mm. who was a man. And I just had made a couple characters and I went, there was a moment where I was like filling out the character sheet and got to the part that said gender and was instinctively going like M. And then I was like, well, why? Why is that instinctual? I could be anything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and it, it was almost enough to like tip me over the edge the thought of you could, so why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And it was so much fun. That's cool. And yeah. uh, of being like, you could, so you should. Yeah. You should try. And in try, and then of course I l fell in love with the character and played her for so long. I got her to seventh level, which in second edition is no small feat. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. She had a <laughs> uh, green steel, a long sword, like a Baetorian long sword oh that burst into flame. Yes. But I remember speaking about heroism as well. There was a moment where she. Um, uh, there was this, uh, I think Matt said on this on the podcast before, but in any case, this very sadistic DM had us with this, uh, we were trapped, surrounded by Modrons, there was a portal, the portal needed a portal key to be activated, and the portal key was a severed eye. And cool. we were trying to rescue this young girl. Oh my God. And the DM had set it up like, LOL, like you gotta, you gotta like m mutilate the girl, ha ha ha. And I Is this looked, someone that I know, the DM? No, you don't okay. know this person. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but they said like, you gotta mutilate the girl. And I was, and I saw the other players look around like, what are we gonna do? And I just went, Evia takes her clawed hand, reaches in, pulls her eyeball no! out, and Ugh. puts it through the door. Ugh. And uh, that's great. And it was, but I remember feeling something like unlock in my chest, yeah. where I was like, oh, you can make the selfless choice. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Like, and it wouldn't have occurred to me before, but seeing how scared everybody else was, you just were like, <clears throat> Oh my God, that's awesome too. Okay, that's what I love about you as a player because you, I think it's just so easy to be like, oh, they're just an NPC. Like, it'll be horrible and gruesome and we can like feel bad about it, but like it's not one of our players. And so it's, I love that you like took a personal choice not even to save another 
real human, but like a NPC, like this is a little girl. We're here have, to save yeah, her. You have to, to save her. That's great. It's uh, amazing. It's so cool. <laughs> and the DM was like, "I'm going to give you minuses. You're not going to be as good at sword fighting without your eye." And I was like, "Cool, that's fine." You get a cool eye patch. It, I did have a cool eye just, patch. I it's, changed. A, it's a win-win for everybody, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love that. I did change her character illustration to have an eye patch, and awesome. I was like, "This yeah. has only made her cooler." Yeah, that's uh, that's really really good. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna use that. That's fun. <laughs> um, but I love that. Um, when you look back, are there similar for like PCs you've played or like NPCs? Um, are there other things like that where you see like moments where you discover things about yourself or your identity? And I'll also, even though this is a D and D kind of tabletop role playing podcast, even like Wayfinder. Going back to LARP characters. That's a good question. Um, yeah, because I definitely have DM'd more at this point, like, and gotten more into DMing. Um, playing for me, like, funnily enough, always feels I get really nervous in a way that I don't when I'm DMing. Like, mm -hmm. it feels really vulnerable. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I definitely, Wayfinder, our LARP camp, definitely, like, had a lot of those moments of just being like, I was such a classic shy nerdy kid and to just be those moments where you're like, I can step out and do something. I can take an action. I can declare something loudly. Um, I remember like we played a horror game once, which were always my favorites, um, <laughs> where it was like modern and it was like a bus full, full of school kids had crashed on the side of the road while like a cult was doing murders in the woods. Um, and they're just, it's like basically a horror movie, but it is a LARP. It's the scariest thing. Like I can't do haunted houses anymore because they don't affect me because <laughs> I'm just like, this is nothing. Because <laughs> um, the LARPs are so scary. But like, I definitely remember that one, like getting so into it and so scared and fighting so desperately for my life. And just yeah. having this thing of like, I don't know, it was a very profound experience to just be like, oh, I would fight this hard if I had to. Like I would... I care very much about like being alive and like helping other people and just like trying to like, I don't know, it's like, that's just like, it's such an obvious one, but it, it's like, you know, you don't usually have an experience like that where you have to genuinely fight for your life. And so mm -hmm. I remember finding that really profound. Yeah. From LARP camp. Uh, yeah. It's a really, f there's, I remember there was a uh, uh, like, yeah, you, those moments in LARPing and D&D &D, wherever else where you do realize even though it's fake, it's just real enough mm -hmm. to start to trigger parts of your subconscious, train yourself to react in certain ways. Um, you know, there's a funny moment here when I first started working at college, where we were having a big writer's meeting, and it was like, I think my first week here, and someone said something like, um, oh, if the, like, the zombie apocalypse happened, I'd kill myself, ha, ha, ha. And someone else was like, oh, yeah, the zombie apocalypse happened, I'd be done right away. And there was like a little lull, and I went, I don't believe any of you. <laughs> I think if the zombie apocalypse happened, you would all find a, a taste for blood. <laughs> and everyone was like, Jesus Christ, Brennan. And I was like, no, I think that we all, we like to joke about mm -hmm. how soft we are. We're actually not that soft. Mm -hmm. Even the soft people are not as soft as they think they are. Yeah. When it comes down to it and your friends are in danger, you will be amazed at the strength you have within you. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's, I think, the way that, uh, I think that's something that role-playing games can bring out in us. Definitely, yeah. I think like also like another thing from D&D &D that's less a character trait, but just like a skill of myself is like, when I started DMing, I started doing it because I moved to Los Angeles and I didn't know a lot of people. And it was a really good way to like meet people and bring a group together. Mm -hmm. And it was like the scariest thing to me. Like it's so, it's so scary, like I, I was, just a writer of comics at that point, I was used to having this really solitary creation process where I go away and then after a year, I'm like, here's a fully finished book and like now people can read it. Like nobody could read it before then. Um, and so I really, to me, like writing and coming up with stories, it was just this like intensely solitary process, but I really, really wanted to make friends. And so I was like, I'm gonna try to do it. And it was just so cool getting into DMing and realizing that I could come up with stuff on the spot, really like realizing that you guys would throw curveballs at me and I could take them and keep a poker face and come up with something totally just like on the fly. Um, and that was something I never, I sort of thought I couldn't do. And then, but just being, I guess, socially motivated to do it was like, I'm now I work as a writer and I'm in a, a writer's room and it's like, that's my favorite thing ever. Cause it's just like D and D all the time. Like you're just coming up with ideas and like, you just have to throw out a million things and see what, what sticks on the wall. And it's like, I, I don't know. It's, it's this, it's this level of confidence that it's like a confidence in that, like, even if I don't 
have a billion stories prepared, even if I don't have extensive notes on this campaign, even if I'm you know, going into a story breaking session on my show and I don't have like a ton of ideas, I can trust in my brain that stuff is gonna rise out. Like it's a really cool muscle that I just, I never used to have it or I wasn't confident in it. And I feel like, like it was just like, I really got it from DMing. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I and know. It's so beautiful. Yeah. You guys gotta play this game. You Have will... you heard of it? <laughs> <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. It's very fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to move into some questions. These are from uh, fans of the show on our mm -hmm. Discord server. Dropout.tv is the website. If you sign up there, you can uh, go and head over to our Discord server. Uh, also, if you're watching this podcast, you're probably watching it two weeks after all of our Dropout subscribers already got to see it. So why not head over to Dropout? Um, this first one is from Marlyle, parentheses Colin. Thank you, Mar uh, Marlyle. Hi, Colin. Hi, Colin. Um, a common piece of DM advice I hear is to occasionally fudge dice rolls and basically lie to the players in service of making the confrontations feel more dangerous and or balanced. How do you decide when to let the dice rule supreme versus, oops, I burped, uh, versus stepping in to make the story more entertaining for the players? Do you approve of the ethics of fudging dice rolls? <laughs> Whoa, very controversial it's a question. Loaded question. Loaded question. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, this is really interesting. I know, I feel like we have different feelings on this, so I'm curious to hear what, how you, how you do it. Here's what I would say. Um, dice roll, there are a lot of tools for you as a DM to use before you get to the need to actually fudge a die roll, right? Um, uh, there are, if someone has like not been successful in a long time in battle, and you can see that it's ruining their experience of the session, you can decide to give them advantage. If someone is on death's door or, or you're worried about something, you know, your NPCs can make a choice. Like sometimes DMs will be like, oh, if a monster knock somebody down, they should go in for the kill every time. And if you don't, you're like taking it easy on your player characters. And you go like, no, the monsters are prioritizing active combatants versus people that are unconscious. That makes sense. Uh, that's what you should do in a fight. So there's a lot of ways that you can steer narrative without having to fudge die rolls. Um, I would say that uh, for the most part, and I also am someone that likes to roll in front of the board a lot for big mm -hmm. important rolls, which means I literally can't fudge mm -hmm. the die roll because it's happening in front of people, like the Box of Doom on Dimension 20. Um, but I would say that, um, yeah, the threat of the dice needs to be very credible. Um, I'm sure that DMs that I have played with have maybe fudged a die roll here or there. Um, it doesn't break the whole continuity of the story. It doesn't break the reality of the world uh, to do it extremely sparingly. But what I would say is there is very few, there, there are very few things in the game that are as precious a resource as the authority of the dice and the player's understanding of the risk involved with their decision making. Mm. And if that feeling of truth goes away, you are sapping actual real joy from the players. If you fuck up the dice too much, if you're too weird mm -hmm. with the dice landing as they are, people start to go, oh, this isn't, we're not really taking real risks. And mm -hmm. then some of the joy goes away. That's my feeling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Molly, how do you feel That's about That's interesting. Yeah, I feel super comfortable fudging everything. <laughs> um, and I think it's, but it's like, I feel like I've only like dipped a toe into like like uh, like online D and D community. I know there's always a lot of discourse, but I feel like what's special about D and D is that everyone it's just the thing you do in your home. So it's like you can do it however you want. Mm -hmm. But like my, I think I don't know. I do I do I understand what you mean. I think dice are like they are like sort of the physics of the world a little bit. So you do want it to be. Um, realistic and yeah. you want it to have this feeling of danger you want to feel like oh my god they might roll a 20 or they might roll a one and like th these interesting dramatic things will happen um, and so I try to like preserve it as much as possible um, but I also I think it's I think it's like a question of like what are you doing with 
D&D, are you interested in creating a realistic sort of scenario hmm. where it's all it's already figured out and it's a very solid world that the characters are moving through, almost like a video game? And that's totally valid. Um, my personal interest is more to tell a narrative. And so I feel like I, over everything else, I prioritize pacing. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's like, this is almost like less for dice and just more for like preparation in general, where I see people getting very stressed of like how much they have to prepare and like, oh my God, I have to draw like a map of every single building they're gonna go to and all this stuff. And it's like, you can sort of just go with the flow and listen to your narrative instincts and be like, the thing that happens next is the thing that feels narratively like it should happen next in the story. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I I do understand that mindset and I, it's interesting. I would say that there are, there is, let's be honest, there's a price you pay for fudging roles. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think any DM is saying fudge a ton of roles. No. You're talking about very specific moments where your story would potentially get fucked. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's a time where it's like, is this going to kill a character because of some random, like did the dice roll shockingly well and you're gonna kill a character at a time when it would be really narratively unsatisfying. strange. Yeah, and just unsatisfying is the thing because that also takes away from player joy if it's like, yeah, you were killed by a goblin who fired a weirdly good arrow. And like, <laughs> it's it's just like, it's like, I don't know. It's like, yeah, if in Lord of the Rings, like Legolas was like taken out by a fucking <laughs> goblin who threw a rock and you're like, well, that's not how Legolas is supposed to go. like. A hundred percent. I will say this. So so the price you pay for overly fudging roles is that risk goes away. And that mm -hmm. your players, if, if you if you have players that are of a mindset of like, hey, the dice are, are more like an aid mm -hmm. than they are an authority, yeah. um, that's totally okay. If you don't have players that are like that, I would say that you really do run a risk of suddenly them going like, oh, if you're willing to subvert the rules to get the story where it needs to be, why am I bothering to think strategically or to fight hard? Mm -hmm. Why am I bothering to take these risks seriously? Mm -hmm. If it's if we're just going to fudge stuff to make the story go along, then why don't I just kick back and take a nap and you tell me when we get to the end? You know, like <laughs> sure. there is that yeah. element there that people, that, that's being very extreme, but there is an element where it's like, oh, part of my ability to engage is the understanding that, um, I will say this, part of the ability to engage is part of an understanding that the dungeon master and the dice actually kind of have a good cop, bad cop relationship, mm -hmm. which is how I like to think about it, mm. where when I set up a battle, like once the minis are on the table, once the fucking boss comes out and the huge figurine is out there, then I as the DM go, guys, I'm, I'm sorry, it's out of my hands. I'm basically <laughs> yeah. a ref at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and that, and and, then, and it's like, if you wanna tell someone you have a problem, talk to the dice. And the dice are not going mm -hmm. to be empathetic to your concerns about your character's story. What does that create? A feeling of real danger, which yeah. is fun. Yeah. That being said, I think that, um, uh, there are different rules for this in different places. And there's different levels of fudging die rolls, right? Um, so like, uh, if you roll in front of the board, obviously you can't fudge it. If the PCs have seen it, yeah. you can't just say, no, ignore that, take yeah. it away. If you're rolling behind the board, obviously, you know, why do we even have DM screens? Nominally, the reason that there are DM screens is so that you are not tipping your player's hands to the level of bonuses mm -hmm. or what results are happening from which rolls or like how much damage you're rolling, et cetera. Yeah. And it's very ominous to hear the clattering of the dice. Very ominous. You to hear the a lot and you're like, oh, no. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but there is something to be said for like, let's say that you have a number of enemies facing everybody um, and you have like four enemies that are there, roll all four of their saving throws and then be like, okay, two of these saving throws fail to succeed. I'm going to decide that these are the two that fail, right? That's not really fudging a die roll, but you're like mm -hmm. rolling and apportioning narratively, like where do I want the good yeah, saves and the bad yeah. saves to go? There's stuff like that where I think there's some give and take uh, that where where narrative and harsh consequence can meet. Yeah. Because I'll say this, as much as there is the threat on the one side of stakes and danger going away, you do pay a heavy price on the flip side for never fudging a die roll. 
I had this villain in this campaign. I was running with a bunch of college humor cast members where we had this badass hunter who was this like demon masked archer who was firing from half a mile away and he was super fucking scary. He was supposed to be a villain like forever. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the first time they encountered him, it was a cliff. They were in a valley with cliffs over them at sunset, and the sun was setting over the cliffs, and the arrows were coming from the setting oh my God, sun. That's so, cool. so they couldn't see where. <laughs> yeah. And it was dealing like, you know, 40 damage in yeah. an arrow, and they were. It was like, there was like poison happening. It was very, very scary. They went, they spent two hours of real playtime planning a trap. They rolled incredible. <laughs> My guy rolled bad. And I had to, after the first session that he mm -hmm. was introduced, be like, you catch him and he's dead. <laughs> because they did it. They got yeah. him. Now, they fucking loved that. And weirdly, it was... It was narratively unsatisfying, but in a way that they loved. Well, and also if they put the effort in, yeah. I think it's. I think it is just like, it's being in tune with your players and understanding if you have players who are really crunchy, who get really into the numbers, then yeah, the dice have to be very respected. Yeah. Um, and I do, I do like, I agree that it's like, you want consequence and danger mm -hmm. to feel real. Um, I think, I think it is just like, there is so much math involved and it put me off of like playing 3.5. I was just yeah. put off by just being like, that part is not fun for me. I, I want to like play a cool story with cool characters. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and like solve mysteries and puzzles and talk to people and like uncover interesting stuff. And so those, like, it's just like knowing what you as the DM and what your players find the most interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that there's sometimes is room to like, yeah. if people are more character and story motivated. I totally agree. Yeah. What I will say is this, I think you, don't need to fudge die rolls if you are willing to have your story take really weird turns mm -hmm. because the dice are not necessarily good writers. Yeah. So if you feel like doing a lot of extra legwork as a DM to fix moments where the story takes a sudden mm -hmm. bizarre turn, it's cool to have that amount of integrity yeah. uh, for the rules. If you do not feel as confident in your ability to take weird haymaker punches to the jaw from the dice, and a moment comes up where you've rolled behind the screen, you're looking at something and you're like, oh, this is total party kill. Or this is my villain getting captured mm -hmm. in a way that now the campaign is over. Or these moments, for me, I would try to solve those with storytelling. Yeah. If you don't feel confident in your improv or your writing ability, I think it's okay. Yeah. Every great once in a while, <laughs> you cheats to shh. Shh, to do what you gotta do. Yeah. But work on not having to. Yeah, but I mean, and that's a whole other thing too, where like, of course you can prepare brilliantly, and it's also, it's like, how much time do you have to prepare? How much can you, build the NPCs out, you cannot build an NPC as thoroughly as each PC is built. So you cannot give them the full set of abilities. Right. Like, and so it is like, even if like they have really good stats, they don't have this like real wealth of abilities that the PCs have. Sure. And so I feel like that's tricky too, where it's like your hunter character, your your villain, like, like if you'd if you'd had the time to build him like like as as lovingly probably as everybody was building their PC, he probably would have had more things to help him escape from a trap and 100%. help him avoid stuff like that. And so that's like always tricky to me too, where it's just like, I think I think like I just, I feel like people get like so intimidated about DMing yeah. that I'm always just like, if there's like a shortcut that's easy for you, like I don't, don't feel bad about taking it. Like it's, it's uh, like whatever sort of serves like having a good time with your friends. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, this is from Maya the Inferno. Thanks, Maya. How do you come up with names for characters, places, deities, etc., that are creative and mm. meaningful? That's fun. It's a very fun question. Yeah, I um for the campaign I just ran, I had a full list of I like at the beginning I went through and just generated a huge list of like human names, dwarf names, elven names, like city names, um, which was really fun because then whenever I needed something I could just like pop over to that document and grab something from that. And so I found that like incredibly useful um, yeah. because you will need to like come up with names on the fly, which is always really difficult to do. Yeah. And ended up with an elf named Gary at one point in our <laughs> campaign. Poor Gary. <laughs> He I was hypnotized. His family was kidnapped. It was very sad. Very sad. I remember yeah. Gary. Uh, 
There was, I named an elf in my campaign Horizon that I ran from when I was like 12 to 17. Okay. I named this elf and one thing just a heads up about names in general is that um names are all in our real world names are rooted in the languages that produced them right so names are connected to a culture and that culture has a language which means that there's always a potential for cultural appropriation you should watch out when you're building fantasy cultures not to harmfully appropriate from real world cultures and like fetishize or exoticize them um but what you'll see in a lot of world building, even in the player's handbook, is like, oh, we try to make names from a given land or people use the same phonemes, sound similar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the thing that lets you know that some someone named Tordek or Ragdor is probably a dwarf, mm -hmm. and that someone named like Milo Bitty Bottle is mm -hmm. probably like a fucking halfling or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I named an elf in this campaign. It was using elven phonemes. It sounded like an elven name. I had never said it out loud before. Uh, I just wrote it down, uh, and he was the assistant to a dragon. This I'm going to spell this elf's name okay. for you, and you can see what the trouble I got into. Okay. The way you spell this elf's name is F A L. A S. Uh huh. F A L A S. This is so funny. I did this exact same thing for like, <laughs> not for D and D, but for like a novel that I wrote once when I was a kid. Literally the same thing. And I showed it to my dad, and he was like, "You might just, you might, you might just want to change." I didn't realize it until literally That's they were on the so deck. So funny. They were on the deck of the ship. This like silver <laughs> dragon was speaking. He had his like elven sorcerer <laughs> assistant next to him, and he was like, "Very well, you heroes have done <laughs> exemplary this day. Now for me to return home. Come, Phallus." And I I went, and everyone exploded into laughter, and I went, what? And they said, his name is Phallus. Yep. And I was like, I, oh, no. Oh, my God. And it's like, that yeah. sounds elven. Those are elven sounds. <laughs> say it out loud. Say it out. So that's Before my first. Before you say it at the table. My yeah. first step, yeah, first trick is say it out loud. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> so beautiful. I love that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's fun, too, because it's just like, I don't know, I think, Maybe this is just me being like a lazy DM or something, but I just, the real world is so random and complicated that sometimes an element of randomness or complexity um, or like things that don't make obvious sense is okay. We grew up in upstate New York. There are like a lot of cities with Native American names. There are a lot of towns with like Dutch names. Mm -hmm. It's just like, there's like, I don't know, there's like all these different cultures that come together and mix. That's not like one uniform thing. And so it's very, I think like recognizing that like, like, it can sometimes like allude to the complexity of your world. If yes. there is like a dwarven town named like Tarandiel, and you're like, wow, what's the story here? Like maybe yeah. elves settled it or something. Like there's there's just like, yeah, you can kind of like um, let your world, I feel this with like all fantasy, not just D&D, &D, but like books and movies as well. Like let your world be as complex and random. Like if you took anything from this real world and tried to explain why it was this way. Why is New York called New York? Why is it called, why is it a new version of a city somewhere else? Why is that city called York? Could not tell you. Like yeah. it's it's like like you can allow this element of weirdness to it's yeah, really give I your world texture. I think that's really fascinating. And what's interesting about this is a question about names has immediately become a conversation about history. That's yeah, which is yeah. I think unavoidable. One of my favorite factoids is um, I had a, 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 a basically in English. I forget it was I think my mom or it was like a professor. Someone was telling me about this, but it was like. Um, History is so deeply woven into language, inescapably. Mm -hmm. uh, and by history, of course, we also mean politics, the politics of mm -hmm. the past continuing yeah. to the politics of the present and the future, but that it's all woven into our language. You cannot escape it, which is always frustrating when people are like, why has it got to be political? And you're like, you fucking ding dong. It it's everything's is, political. Yeah. It always is. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, what's interesting is with this setting, uh, they were talking about, in English, the English language, um, the words uh, cow, pig, and chicken uh, refer to the animal, whereas beef, poultry, and pork refer to the meat, mm -hmm. right, from those animals. Why are there two different words? Well, not only are there two different words for each, they're from different languages. Cow, mm -hmm. chicken, and pig are Germanic, 
and uh, pork, poultry, and beef are French because in England, during the time of the Norman uh, conquest and Norman rulership, uh, the people tending the animals were Saxons and Germanic folk in the fields, and their aristocratic lords were Normans who spoke French. Oh my God, that's amazing. So there's yeah. a literal, it's like, Politics yeah. and lived life and the facts of how your society is structured create the language you speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the language comes back and reinforces elements of that culture, right? So when you're thinking of names for your D&D campaign, I think something to kind of make peace with is... You know, what are you trying to do when you're making a name? You're just trying to create a feeling, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you're going to try to, like, what's a good name for my wizard character? What's interesting is history and politics is going to make its way into that. Yeah. Because what are you going to name your wizard? Quentin? Uh, Niles, uh, you know, like, yeah. like Radagast, Radagast, right? Something yeah. like that. Uh, uh, you're you're either going to refer to Tolkien, or you're going to create some kind of aristocratic British-sounding mm -hmm. name, right? Uh, and it's very interesting because ev everything about the way we feel about things uh, is based on real-world culture and history. It's really hard to escape from, yeah. I think. Yeah, and it is, it can be very, it's interesting in D&D, &D, which can be such a stream of consciousness as you're like really just trying to like come up with stuff on the fly. You can like, yeah, it's it's the, you, you're drawing from this like, your all of your cultural stores, a lot of which is full of these like sort of like biases and like stereotypes and tropes, which are not all like bad or harmful, but just like, they're reinforcing stuff. And so, yeah, I think it's fun when you're coming up with stuff to sort of like re-examine where you're getting your ideas from. If something just bubbles up as like, this is the right name for a wizard, be like, so why is that? And like, what would another more interesting name for a wizard be <laughs> that like you wouldn't hear somewhere? Right. And then that can kind of suggest a more interesting and unique uh, feeling to your fantasy worlds. A hundred percent. So yeah, uh, examining biases, uh, creating cool names for people. Um, and it's really interesting, I think too, because there are elements of trope that you are acknowledging whether you're fighting them or accepting them. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, sure. yeah. um, uh, and uh, some trope is necessary for things to work. Like you go watch the old Lord of the Rings movies and you're like, look at how the elves are all speaking in RP. There's, it's like received pronunciation British. So it's like, we are the elves. We speak in this manner. We are the good guys, mm -hmm. right? And then you, these orcs are like, I don't like you looking at me. I'm speaking with a cockney accent. And you're like, yeah, I hate the lower classes yeah, as well. I know. And, and you're like, oh no. Uh, but, the, <sighs> but the flip side is true mm -hmm. too, because I think there's someone did this cool etymology thing with me uh, of like, when you hear, um, uh, if you're going somewhere and you have an invitation in your hand, would you rather go to a place where you've been promised a hearty welcome, or would you rather go to a place where you've been promised a cordial reception? Mm. Um, they both mean mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. But you're like, for me at least, I'm like, ugh, cordial reception. <laughs> Fucking, I won't be able to touch shit. It's gonna be cold. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll go to the hearty welcome. Um, Cause it, Cut and, to me like going home, rewriting my wedding invite. <laughs> God damn it. God damn it. Oh no. Brandon's not going to come. <laughs> <laughs> but there is an element of yeah. like uh, cultural bias even in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're creating names for your, for your PCs, I think like look at your favorite uh, novels, fantasy novels. Um, think about the feeling you want these names mm -hmm. to evoke. But when you're also thinking about the fact that um, different names and languages evoke different feelings, different just sounds evoke different feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, why is that, right? Yeah. Uh, and examine that a little bit. Why? Yeah. yeah, and that it just, if you do, you can make a wizard who is just the most classic, wonderful wizard with a long gray beard who's named Quentin. Mm -hmm. um, or you can sort of like put your own spin on it. And I think that often at the table that leads to creating more of an interesting community where you guys have your own like like icons of this world, your own kind of like uh, tropes that exist in this world um, mm -hmm. that I, f I think can be really, really fun. Um, that's what I, I like love so much about D&D &D, is that you can just make this world that is like so separate from our own 
um, and you can really like have like just play in it. I yeah. love that so much. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the, um, the advice I thought to give for this question about how do you name NPCs was deeply contemplate the ethics of everything that you're doing to the point where you feel uh, <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> like someone probably just wanted something simple like, hey, just uh, like you can look up a names Google book. a names generator. There's a <laughs> lot of them out there. Elf name generator, dragonborn name generator. They're all there. It's so helpful. Yeah, if you don't want a big list, that is genuinely so helpful. Yeah, yeah. if you want to, if you don't want to <laughs> go on a long journey of the soul and examining which systems of oppression you're complicit in, uh, <laughs> go find a good uh, name generator yeah. online. Um, yeah. Wonderful, guys. This has been such a wonderful talk. Thank you so much to my guest yeah. Molly Ostertag. Thank you for having me. This uh, was great. We had a wonderful time here at Adventuring mm -hmm. Academy, and we'll <laughs> see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Hey gang, it's Brennan from College Humor. If you like that last one, make sure to sign up for Dropout, where you can hang out with the cast and crew in our exclusive Dropout Discord server. Caveat, the Discord server is full of bees. I mean, like physically full of bees. If you log on, bees will start to come out of your computer. Um, I don't have a problem with that because they are just honeybees, which are actually good for the environment, so.